it's a survey exhibition. It represents 30 years of work. So the first works in the show date from 1984 and the most recent, I guess, from 2013. So it's effectively 30 years. It's more photographic than anything else, but there are some artist books in the show, there's video, and there's also some textile work. One of the things I resist all the time in talking about my work is the kind of demand to tell a story because I think it's the most obvious response for a lot of people is that my work is trying to tell stories about these people who have kind of lost a history. And I'm always trying to resist that because I think it's, again, it's more important to establish that there was a gap rather than to fill it in with a narrative. One of the bodies of work that's represented in the exhibition is um, it's work from 2003 and there was quite a lot of, I made quite a lot of work in that year and the, the part of it that's in the exhibition is actually a relatively small part but a very important part. So there are four artist books which will be inside a case, you won't actually be able to handle them and there's a reason for that. And there's also some photographic work that kind of belongs to the same project. It was dealing with um, a little body of archival photographs that were taken in Gladesville Psychiatric Hospital in 1948. And there were 38 photographs and each photograph was taken of a female patient who was standing in the grounds of the hospital, sometimes with a nurse kind of, you know, holding her or touching her, sometimes with another patient in the background. And their origin, apart from the fact they were taken in the hospital, was really obscure. It was all the information that would have once upon a time been available to go with them has all disappeared. So I got hold of those photographs. Um, they were at the time in the public domain but they've since been taken away because they're considered to be um, patient records as well as photographs. And I made after a lot of you know agonizing around what can I do with these images, what can't I do with these images, I finally made a set of four artist books and one of the books contains images that are details of the women's faces in those photographs which is the reason why you can't actually handle them because there's still these issues of privacy and stuff around those photos. But what I did last year was to start thinking about that archive again and to think that there was a kind of energy in those mid 20th century photographs that even though I tried so hard to do the right thing by them, I'd kind of failed to capture this energy. And then it occurred to me that I could, I could somehow work with performers because performers, you know, I mean, their work is so totally in the present. It's all about the physical body. And so I started to do that. And some of the work that came out of those experiments is also in this exhibition. Yeah, so these photographs, which I had initially dealt with by cropping them and using the cropped details of them. And I then, like this completely different approach, which has for me been really liberating actually, to work with the performers with these lengths of felt. Yes, yeah, like to harness their energy and their way of working, mm. which I don't have much control over really. I mean, I can tell them, hold it up. But we did these other photographs where they actually just kind of improvise underneath those lengths of felt. Mm. And whenever I think that the image you know, is doing something, I take the photograph. How do you arrive on the lines and the shapes of the... Those were derived from the patient's clothing. So it's either the seams or it's where they, you know, they join. And of course, you know, all of those pieces of felt, I dyed them so they would be what I considered to be kind of institutional clothing colours. I was really struck by the way the things they wore in these photographs, where they were wearing jackets and things, you could see how they'd been felted by, you know, so much kind of wear and use and bad washing. And so I just kind of did something with that. So these, those things to me are kind of a bit like surrogate bodies, but they also have this really, you know, strong reference to, to their clothing. And they capture the, the kind of trace of those formal elements. They do, but then they've got like whatever it is in that precise moment that the performer is doing with them, including some cases shaking them. And it's, you know, it's just that thing which always really 
I like it a lot when you get something that is both repetition and variation as a kind of formal device that always works for me. That sounds like this, you know, this spool of film though as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. And it, and it also, yeah, of course, it looks, you know, it looks like that. The other thing about these that really, really I didn't anticipate but I like a lot is that I also think of them as masks for the body. Could you tell us a bit about going to Tasmania and seeing this site? The history of this site that I'm really interested in is the way it was for a period in the late or mid to late 19th century, it was a the site of a prison for female convicts. So if you were convict in Tasmania and you did something else bad, they put you in prison. And one of the reasons that women were often imprisoned was because they got pregnant, because you weren't allowed to get pregnant if you weren't married. Um, so there, were, there was a nursery here as well as accommodation for the women themselves. And they were supposed to, you know, do hard work and be sort of reformed by doing all this hard work and then, then they'd be sent back out again into the, you know, to get another job. And this is the site, um, it's at a place called Ross, which is in the Tasmanian Midlands. So when you go there, I mean, it's changed since I photographed there. Apparently they've now got, you know, more signage and more interpretation. But when I went there, there was almost nothing. So you'd walk over this ground and it was, it was a sheep paddock. I mean, sheep were grazing there. So there were the little pellets and depending on the season, the grass would be chewed right down. And the only thing that was there was that could kind of suggest that it had this particular history was in one end of the paddock, the ground was really uneven. And on the other end, there was one place where there was, you could see there was a mound and at one end there was a, a stone that you presumably was the entrance to a building. So that was it. Mm -hmm. So I photographed those things, but I just photographed the ground generally. And when I started photographing, I was always looking down. But then I went back, you know, like over a few years, taking more very similar photographs. And in the end, I gradually started looking up and including in some of them a little bit of the horizon. And you can actually, you know, you get more of a sense of the location. You can see that, you know, if you look in the, in the actual images, there's a fence. And, but still, the majority of them are a view more like that, where you look down at the ground. And so there are 30 of them, which unfortunately there won't be 30 of the ACP for space reasons. There'll be, I think, nine or 10. But where, you, where I can exhibit all 30, you know, you, you do get this tremendous sort of sense of space and you walk, you walk in front of them. And as you do that, the light changes as you move by. And so it has a different kind of presence to, you know, photograph paint printed on paper, which has none of that reflective shimmer. So the reflective shimmers turned out to be quite important. Why do I keep on going back to the sides? I think because whatever, the, whatever it was that drew me there in the first place is not that easy to represent. Um, and this is going back to the, the thing about, you know, it's the gaps. I've, I've said this before, it's on record in different places. It's the gaps that draw me. So this, you know, Okay, there's a, there's a place, but there's when you go there, there's so little that you think about what happened there and how in you know a century and a half that can be completely erased. Why is it erased? When did that start to happen? So those are the things that I'm interested in. It kind of bothers me. It just bothers me. It bothers me that that history was so little understood. It bothers me particularly that almost even now there's very little understanding of how many babies were born in those factories and how many of them died really young you know it just seems wrong so if I, you know going back i think i think it's really important when you do work with historical events that your approach is this is going to sound really moralistic but that your approach is not superficial so it's not just me as an artist sweeping in going oh i can fix this you know, I can show you the way it ought to, you ought to think about it. I think that it, it's much better if the approach is partial and repeated and cumulative. So I would be accumulating all of these photographs. They would really gradually over time be changing. And then when I finally get the, you know, flash of inspiration that they ought to be on aluminium, I've got this great big body of photographs to choose from. 
And at that point, you know, something interesting and I think quite good can happen. I don't think it would ever happen if I just went there once and never thought about it again. And I think that principle, to a large extent, governs a lot of the work that I do because I think in one way or another it's a question of time. And the time that you spend and the time that you give it is important and necessary probably, necessary for me anyway. So that's why I find it really satisfying to come back to that work after a long period of time because it now seems that something was kind of generating or vegetating in that time that I can do it differently than the way I could do it 10 years ago. And even though I don't think I'm going to come back to this, you never know, I might. Mm. Um, and that could be a really good thing. There's something to revisiting a body of work and revisiting a site, but there's also there's a re repetition which has a whole other kind of like yes. psychoanalytical kind of element yeah, to it. Yeah, which is a kind of the repetition is a compulsion. Yeah. And the repetition, well, I guess if it's Freud, the repetition is death drive, isn't it? I mean, I made a body of work. In fact, it's included. Some of this work's included in the exhibition. It was, it's called um, I Am the Rehearsal Master. And one of the, part of my thinking about that was uh, around repetition. Repetition, repetition, is rehearsal in French. It's a French word for rehearsal. So, and that work was in formally really similar to this. They're, they're grid works. So that was about repetition. And I mean, I like the fact that repetition is also a variation. You're not ever repeating the exact same element. You're repeating something like, but different. And I, you know, I think that's quite dynamic. Hence, you know, the formal structure of that and the formal structure of those 1989 works from I Am the Rehearsal Master is really similar. And, you know, I, I like a, that. It's <laughs> a really good work to talk about in terms of the formal structure being a grid and a grid kind of talks to the idea of the institution. But obviously that is very institutional in terms yes. of the images of the women yeah, but it's also a modernist grid, you see. It's not, and, and it's interesting, like when the 1989 work, because it has a 19th century look, which I actually laboured to achieve, um, I don't think many people really thought about that. But with this one, because the felt seems to remind people very much of Boisian felt, um, that, that's been pointed out to me a number of times and also I think the white lines, you know, they're quite, it's an abstraction. Mm. And that's another thing I really love about, I guess, photography partly for me because it's both real in the sense of real bodies, real space, real events, but it also has this potential for abstraction which can be both like intellectual abstraction but formal as well. So, I, you know, I do get off on those things. And um, I think I probably rely on them quite a lot in my work. So yeah, those, those lines are abstractions of you know, the clothing, the way the clothing was put together. And then it also has that other layer of something that you know, is in bits and pieces and held together in like only just held together, which is quite psychological. So those interpretations are possible too. But, you know, not obligatory, but they're possible. Is there also an element that in kind of really enjoying these formal qualities, you can generate that austerity which you were talking about in regards to these historical events? Yes, I think that's, that's, that's a good comment. Um, because the formal quality, in the formal qualities, there's often, you know, a kind of quality of detachment and a quality, you know, the formal restraint. All of those things, I think, I think I use them a lot, um, partly just for aesthetic reasons, but maybe more importantly because I think that's a parallel to the kind of harshness or, you know, lack or poverty of these events that I'm kind of trying to get at in some way. I guess the thing about texture and textiles goes back to the very earliest work. I mean, the first work that I ever made was carnal knowledge where the, the faces in those photographs are overlaid with the stony textures, you know, and the body of work that I made after that, which is Scenes on the Death of Nature, the stone texture disappeared, but the, tex the texture of the clothing becomes really important. And certainly that's come back with a vengeance. 
but in the meantime, it was always there in those photogram works, of which I made heaps at one at a certain time. And you know, they were. An, I mean, that's that image up there is. Um, it's actually a copy. A copy photograph from one of those photogram works. So the photogram is actually much larger because it's a big garment. But that kind of quality of there's a. I don't know. There's just. It's so tactile, but it's not. It's a flat piece of paper. <laughs> That's something that really interests me. And I guess it's maybe it's relating to what I said before about, um, the, you know, and the photograph can be both hyper-realistic and at the same time it's always an abstraction. And those two things, because they, you know, they're to a certain extent at odds with one another, I always find those little... Um, disjunctions really productive. So you can, you know, th that's not a bad example of something that has a tremendous illusion of three dimensionality, but it is totally flat piece of paper. And to be able to make that, and it's a very photographic process as well, it's like pure photography. You just put the thing down on the photographic paper and shine a light on it, and it's done. I think that's what fascinates me. I mean, if you think about, I mean, that and everything else, if you think about the the surface and then the inability to have the surface through the photograph but then also the photograph being this kind of evidence maker or this kind of thing located to so much of so much specific time but then as you say you kind of you're not filling in that gap of time you're kind of walking around it all. yeah but maybe by analogy by kind of working even if you're just working around it, you're working around it quite hard. And sort of, you know, an analogy I've used before is like embroidering the edge of that gap. Just by doing that, I think you suggest that there is something there worth atten attending to. And that's pr probably, you know, really all I'm trying to do is to enhance something um, that interests, you know, that really interests me.